James, welcome. I'll give a, a couple more minutes here. There's a few people that requested it, still haven't joined. I'll go wait till about 310 and then we'll we'll jump into the presentation. I want to test drive this. This is actually a presentation I'm going to be giving at Fort Worth Camera for Canon. So if you see anything, uh, please put it in the chat or, you know, hey, ask a question, say, did you think about this? You know, because my main concern with doing this is not only about having fun, but really, 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 really being safe. Safe for your camera and safe for your eyes. As Shannon was asking, like, hey, can I just stack uh, neutral density filters? And James, I think you had bought some Nisi super dense neutral density filter. So I'll start by saying this. Yes, you can use a neutral density filter for short periods of time or on a wide angle lens, like a medium zoom, 24 to 70, something like that, because you're not directly magnifying the light of the sun. Now, as you get up with longer focal lengths, 200 on, if you're using a mirrorless camera, yes, you can use a neutral density filter as long as you put the lens cap on in shots, right? Again, the neutral density filters don't filter out the high ultraviolet uh, rays and the heat. So when I pop on my neutral, I mean, my uh, solar filter on my uh, lens, this bad boy gets hot. Like when you go to touch it, it's like, woo, you know, it really does take a lot of the heat. It's like a heat sink and it reflects all the uh, harmful rays and lights away from the image sensor and away from the optics. So, and always um, wear glasses whenever you look at the sun. And it's fun to just look at the sun. It's crazy to think, oh, I could put these glasses on and look directly at the sun. You know, it's crazy. But yeah, and it doesn't bother your eyes at all. And always before you look at the sun with your camera or glasses, take your lights and put them right up to a very bright light to make sure there isn't a scratch or a pinhole. Mm -hmm. Because even though that might be coming from the side, that light could still be harmful to your eye, right? And you don't want to do any damage to your eyes or again, the image sensor. All right. So I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to start with uh, sharing my desktop. And this is the keynote presenta presentation together for Canon. And they've uh, been gracious enough to allow me to use the new RF 1200mm lens, which there's only a few of them. So thanks for joining me. Here's all of our contact information. I'm very responsive on our social medias. If you ask a question, I'm happy to share, happy to pay it forward with the knowledge because we've been helped all along the way. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Just want to make sure the audio is good. Yeah, I can hear you great over here. Okay, wonderful. Sounds good. So this is an inspiration shot. So my goal when I'm photographing the eclipse is to take one lens and photograph the progression. And that's going to be a telephoto lens. And another camera, I'll shoot a scene shot ahead of time because I just found it in, I've done two eclipses. I did the one in 2017 and then the annual eclipse last year. And with the wide angle camera, it's just not that dynamic because the exposure range is so wide in between the foreground and the sky that I just found more satisfying results to composite it later. Now, we don't often do composites, but Dawn is our graphics designer and she's amazing at it. So I, I sketched this out and she immediately did this like one, two, three, where it would take me you know, forever in Photoshop to figure this out. But this is the progression. And the reason that the sun is very orange is the particular solar filter, most common solar filters um, will record the sun is orange. There are some filters that just came out this year that aren't crazy, stupid, expensive that will record the sun in more of a white light. But it is more, uh, when you look into astronomy, a natural orange gas. And I like the rendering of it. And uh, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, <laughs> I thought I, thanks for speaking up. All right, there you go. See, let me see, I thought I hit it. 
I appreciate that. I was like clicking on my Zoom. I don't use Zoom. I, I thought I hit share screen because it went blank on my side. Okay, here we go. Now are you seeing it? Yeah, that's epic. That's epic. That's I, it. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> there we go. Better? So that's yeah. our contact info. And again, uh, it doesn't matter if it's Canon or whatever camera you're using, this will apply. It's just I've been a lifelong Canon user going all the way back to high school and a proud member of the Canon Explorers of Light. All right. Oh, back. So again, here's that composite shot. So this is Rob Laporte. Um, I'm going down to Dallas. Don and I are going down to visit him. We actually photographed his wedding and then we became friends because he's into photography. So this is that composite shot. We were at the Shawnee National Forest and we actually got there a day and a half ahead of time. We set up camp chairs. We camped out on the rocks. And good thing we did, because when we woke up in the middle of the night, the day of the eclipse, you'll see a shot of it, we were surrounded by people. And we had a primo spot. So the night sky was amazing. We were, you know, just shooting the stars and happened to hold up a flashlight. And I noticed that there was mist in the air because of temperature difference. And that beam is actually for real. That's not the only thing that's composited in the shot is the progression of the eclipse. And then we thought it would be cool to point it right at the total eclipse. And where I was saying earlier, the reason that the eclipse is not orange in tonality is because that's the only time it is safe to remove your solar filter. In fact, it's encouraged to remove the solar filter because it gets so dark that your exposure would be so long, you'd have a blurry image, right? Because the earth is moving and you would get some rotation in there. Same way when you're photographing stars at night, there is a formula, but basically if you're using a 24 millimeter lens, you do not want to go longer than 30 seconds on the shutter speed because then you'll start to show the rotation of the earth. The longer your lens, the shorter that shutter speed has to be. So if you're at a 50 millimeter lens, it's somewhere around an eighth of a second. And you could uh, Google search the formula for the lens and photographing stars at night. And it will tell you the longest open shutter you can have for the particular focal length of the lens you want to use to avoid getting star trails. So we're going to witness a very cool phenomenon on the 8th. Hopefully the skies will cooperate. And even if it is kind of cloudy, you know, you'll still, if you could see the sun at all, you'll still be able to see it. You'll see it happening in progression. So we're going to go through inspiration, some technical information to help you, the gear, and then you still have time to practice, practice and rehearse. And I'll go through the apps and things that are great to have. Here's some good resources. So you could find out lots and lots of information. Uh, we're going down to Dallas. It's going to have a nice long period of totality. And then here's the progression across the United States. And then it also gives you the information of expected visitors. Mm -hmm. So Maine and Oklahoma are going to have the lowest populated areas if you're interested in doing that, where people are going to go. So, you know, we're going to keep an eye on the weather. And if the skies are better over Arkansas or Texas, we'll just take a quick drive a day or two before. You know, you can get some long range forecasts. Um, again, just Google search it and you'll find it. And here is the links to all that information. So if you want to get a screenshot of this. So there's tons of information there and resources on finding the totality, the maps, the lane, lots and lots of information about exposure. NASA has a fantastic map and you could download this and it's in high resolution detail that shows the path of totality, both from the annular eclipse in 2023 which is this line here. And I was just outside the band. I was in Phoenix for an assignment. And being outside the band and within the band of totality, the umbra is a huge difference because we never received totality in Arizona area where I was in Phoenix quite a ways out of the band. So therefore you got that partial clip. So I never really got dark, dark. 
Now, when you're in the band of totality, I was there in 2017, you really do feel a temperature change. The birds go quiet. There's that phenomenon. It really does, doesn't get as dark as night. It gets as dark as blue hour. And we're going to have a lot of celestial lineup this time. You're going to be able to see, I think, five different planets plus a comet if the conditions are proper. So this is a real useful map. So Indiana's really close to Chicago. Um, Lou, you said you were going to Evansville and, you know, uh, Bloomington is good. I got a couple friends that are going to Ohio and another friend of mine, he's teetering between uh, Bloomington, Indiana and Buffalo, New York, because he's freaking out because of the cloud cover. So it's just fun, fun to do. Again, I know I keep talking about caution and safety, but there's been so much chatter online and on social media. I don't know where people are getting their information that it's okay to use neutral density filters, but you will damage the image sensor on the camera. And if you're using a DSLR, you will cause harm to your eyes. So only use solar filters and solar ISO rated filters. And you could again find out all this information about safety on NASA's website. You could pick up the solar film, which is inexpensive, and the solar film is good. The glass filters are great. You know, the, of course, the glass filter is going to be a little bit sharper than the film. But remember, we're not photographing the surface of the moon. There's not much detail in the sun, right? You're going to see dark spots, and those are solar flares where you're seeing the gas explosions on the sun. So it's not like the moon where you're going to have great detail in the craters and the surface and that texture. There just isn't any. So there really isn't that big of a difference between a glass filter and a solar film filter. Um, I just ordered a new Seymour one last night because I decided to use my 200 to 800 millimeter lens as a second camera as a backup. So I wanted to make sure I had a filter for that. I was going to use my 100 to 500, and I'll show you why here in a second, why I changed my mind. So this is the progression from 2017 of the solar eclipse, right? Totality is in the center. Now, I was unaware of this app at the time, Solar Timer, which is great because I took off my solar filter late because I was paranoid about, because I was using a a digital SLR, I was paranoid about damaging the image sensor and looking through the viewfinder. So I was already into the eclipse when I took, when I realized, take the filter off, you know, so I missed the first diamond ring, but I got the second diamond ring. So this is the annular eclipse and I'm not within the band of totality. This is just a little time lapse to let it run to show you the progression across the sky. Now, this was a, a ground camera that did have the solar filter on it, right? So, you know, and again, it didn't be as, it wasn't as dramatic of a scene. Twofold, one, I believe, because the solar filter, and I'm so wide in this shot, and two, I was well outside the band of totality. Now, this progression is, again, a time lapse of all my images. I don't have a star tracker. A star tracker is a device that will actually track the movement of the planet's rotation or the sun. An inexpensive one is $500. I don't do this often enough to get a star tracker. If you do, it will track the sun perfectly. You will not have to keep moving your camera. So you'll see here in this time lapse that I'm very jerky in my movement because I have to realign my camera during each shot. Right, So the sun's kind of all over the center of the frame as I'm lining it up. But this is just a time lapse again of the annular eclipse. And you can see I never reached totality where the sun is directly, or the moon is directly in front of the sun. The difference between an annular eclipse and a solar eclipse is the annular, you're gonna have more of a sun disk because the moon does not totally block the sun. Where a total eclipse, like we're gonna have on April 8th, the moon is closer in perigee to the earth. So it totally blocks out the sun and we get that amazing corona. So here's the way I did that. And I will do this. I did this in 2017 and I will do it again. 
is my primary camera there because I wasn't there for the eclipse. I was there to photograph uh, a fundraising gala. I brought my 100 to 500 because that was easier to pack with my other gear. And I had a solar filter on both. So the 100 to 500 with the R5 at 500 millimeters and engaging the 1.6 in camera crop gave me a 700 millimeter lens. And I was using a pocket wizard. So when I would photograph live with my primary camera, the 100 to 500, every time I clicked, it would send a signal to the ground camera to fire. And each camera was taking a sequence of seven bracketed shots. So that's one on and then under and over. And I have set up in custom function, which you can do on all of your cameras to start my progression for the bracketing at minus and then go to over. Because the other way I find it confusing, natively, it starts at the proper exposure, then goes under, then goes over. And then when I try to put them together, I'm, I'm always confusing myself and I have to look at the exposures. To where if you set up this custom function, so it starts off at minus and goes to plus, then it makes sense if you choose to combine them. So I was using a uh, platy pod ground plate with the spikes and a platy ball. And it worked out great. And these are both R5s. Now, during the progression, you only need to take a picture about every five minutes. You could take as many as you want, but I learned at that five minute interval, that's when you're going to notice big chunks of differences in the Pac Man taking a bite out of the sun. I took too many in 2017. So then when you're trying to put together that progression, it's like, wait a minute, this one, that one, this one. And you're having to sift through a lot of bracketed sun disk images. But at that five minute interval, you, you really do see that nice progression. So this is where Rob and I camped out. We got here early, decked it out. Here I was just doing some um, night sky photography and I was messing around with a neutral density filter here just to get a longer exposure to show some cloud movement. So this was uh, 48 hours before the actual eclipse. And then we were practicing throughout the night, photographing stars, star trails, cloud rotations, all those fun things. In Baltimore, the nation's economy is seeing impact. So every, everybody cool so far? Thoughts, questions? Rental shipping is free flow. No questions, this is great, great information. Okay. Where, where were you when you shot the annular in, in Arizona? Where about? I was in Phoenix. So I was, I think, about 200 miles outside the band of totality. So I was there for work and I knew it was coming. And like I said, it you don't get that real twilight feeling or blue hour feeling at all. It was like a cloud went in front of the sun versus when you're in the band of totality, like in 2017, you actually felt the temperature change, the animals got quiet, and it became like blue out, and you could see the stars. So that was really a big difference. So lenses, lenses all have their characteristics. You have prime, zooms, wides, telephotos, super tellies, extenders. It all matters, right? Again, don't worry. Like I know, Jim, you have an extender, and you could zoom in on your new camera with the uh, magnification. So go right. ahead because there isn't a lot of information like on the moon, right? So you're really not going to diminish sharpness that much. This is the settings in the gear that I'm going to use. And again, try a screenshot of this. The map from NASA, the Eclipse timer works great for both Android and iPhone. And it, what's great about it is it also has a rehearsal mode so they're going to run through a quick eclipse calling out like C1, C2. And what they're saying by C1, C2, it means first contact, second contact. Okay, one minute to remove to totality. Okay, remove solar filter. Those things are so helpful because you get really excited when your eyes to the viewfinder and when you're photographing. So it's just a means to keep you on time, slow you down, and help you think through it. Shoot raw. Shoot raw and shoot large. That's going to give you the most exposure latitude. And that's what we're going to be exposing for is we're underexposing by seven. Some people recommend 13, right? But I found seven to be a sweet spot. I did nine the first time and th they were too dark. And I'll show you the progression there. 
So when it's that dark, you can see the stars and you get to see the prominences, the solar explosions and the nice ring of fire. As you move toward proper exposure and then over, that's when you'll start seeing the detail in the other planets in the sky, but you're gonna lose the sun's ring. And I'm gonna go through those with you. So my starting baseline exposure is gonna be 250. I'm gonna be at aperture eight because the lens I have has a minimum aperture of F8. So I'm just going in roughly half, two thirds of a stop instead of one full stop. And the starting shutter speed is one five hundredth of a second. Now I know this because I took the R5 with the 1200 millimeter lens in spot meter off the sun, looked at my histogram and figured out the exposure that I like. Hopefully we'll have time to photograph the sun before the eighth and you could practice this and find out what really works for you. I bracketed the exposures for a series of images and I chose to go seven. That was enough information for me. Please, if you shoot with your camera tethered, I know the Canon uh, DPP software allows you to do up to seven exposures. If you use a tethering software like a Smart Shooter, which you could download a free trial for, for, it allows you to shoot as many bracketed exposures as you want. Right, so another colleague of mine wants 13 for whatever reason, and he wants to shoot tethered so he could shoot right into his laptop and look at it, but he has a star tracker. So he's not gonna be optically looking through the viewfinder to keep the sun in the center of the frame. So once he's set up, the camera is gonna move with the sun. We're not me, I'm actually gonna, every time, every five minutes, I gotta keep realigning the sun to be in the center of my frame. The Seymour filters, like I said, that's, those are the ones I've been using. I found them to be great. They work. There's many great solar filters now. You could still get them. ProCam, b and Amazon. Everybody's well-stocked this year. In 2017 was not the case. If you didn't have your solar filter at least a couple of weeks ahead of time, you weren't going to have one. Yeah. So during totality, you can remove the show, solar filter and shoot bracketed, and I suggest shooting as many frames as you can so you get all the different prominences, all the different explosions, solar flares, and corona. And again, I'll share those photos with you. You want a good solid tripod with a gimbal? Um, Pro Media Gear has a 10% discount. If you want to use that, it's Bob 10. If you don't have a good solid tripod, weigh it down because you put a long lens on there and you start slowing down the shutter speed. Ideally, you want to have image stabilization off. And the reason I say that is we are shooting at a great distance, at great magnification. Any vibration or movement will be recorded. And if you try and stack these images and combine them, then your sun disk could be slightly out of alignment when you go to merge all the images. So I just found it better. I shot with image stabilization and without in 17 and during the annual eclipse last year. And I found I enjoyed my results better with everything locked down and IS off. But again, if you're not comfortable doing that, do what works best for you. And that's why I encourage you to try and practice. Nice. And I'm gonna use an electronic cable release just so I am not touching the camera at all to introduce any vibration. Responses and then so solar filters, if you have a big lens, the larger okay. lens, you want to want, measure the diameter across the front element and then order a filter accordingly. Uh, they all have these cardboard solar filters, which will slide right over, which will fit a variety of focal lengths across the front of the lens. So those are great. Uh, the Seymour filter I have is now... It's a six and a half inch. So let me just uh, in here. Let me let them in. One second. I got to stop screen share for a second. Someone just came in. There we go. I'll admit them. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. And then eye protection. Yes. You can see I have the solar filter for both lens 
an 82 millimeter for my uh, 15 to 35 with a step ring down to 77. So I could use that 82 millimeter also on my 100 to 500. So I'm gonna get out of this for a second. Stop screen sharing. And I'm gonna go over here. Live. Why is that? All right. So can you see me on the wide shot here? Yep. Yep. All right. So here's here's the Seymour solar filter. Now this is a large one because it's made to fit on front of a large super telephoto lens. So this is the uh, RF 1200 millimeter lens. Right. And it's actually the same weight and diameter. It's just longer than the 600 millimeter lens that I have. Now I did photograph the uh, sun practicing the 600 with the 2X and I'll show you all those focal, focal lengths in a second. But the way this goes on, it's really quick and easy. You got three little set screws on here. And there is a ring around the front of the lens that's designed for this. So you just tighten these little set screws in there. And again, inspect your filter, make sure there's no light leaks and you're good to go, right? And it's quick and easy. So when it's time for totality and your solar timer says, hey, remove solar filter, when you just pull a couple of set screws, loosen it, and it comes right off. Right. Versus if everything is threaded, you know, then it takes a little bit to twist it on, twist it off and take it on and off. And this is the solar filter that fits my 100 to 500 and the uh, 15 to 35. So I've opted because I have like the to stop. 800 to not take the 100 to 500. And this is going to become apparent the reason why I'm going to do it in a minute. So my primary camera is going to be the R5 with the 1200 millimeter lens. My secondary camera is going to be the R5 with the 200 to 800. And I'm going to have this one somewhere in the 700 millimeter range, right? Just a little bit wider, just to really capture that Corona. And then the third camera I'm going to have is going to be my ground camera. Now, as I said in the past, I'm not going to be photographing the ground camera during the eclipse. I'm going to take a photograph of possibly the city skyline in Dallas, something interesting in the foreground, and then beg and plead with Dawn to make sure that she can beautifully blend it in the progression and make a beautiful, stunning photograph. This is going to be my ground plate. Uh, this is a platypod extreme with a little ball head on it. I do have a riser. I'll probably take the riser off. I use this a lot for events, put it on stage to get my backstage view. Um, the bag I'm going to be using is a mind shift Moose Peterson. They don't make it anymore. But the reason I love this bag is because I can fit a long lens in here without having to take it off of the body. Now the 1200 millimeter, of course, is way too long to fit in here. So it will go into its own case. Um, things I'm going to bring with me, lots of lens wipes, filter wrenches, because if I want to take this filter off of one lens and take the uh, adapter ring off, the step-up ring, often find I can't grab it. So the filter wrenches work great to separate the two. Handy tool to have. Um, I'm going to also have a tool kit. Right, my everyday carry toolkit if I need to repair, tripod, Allen wrenches, screws, and then the pocket wizards. So what I'm gonna do with the pocket wizard is the pocket wizard goes into the hot shoe of the primary R5. And these are transceivers. And then I do the same on the receiving camera so that when I fire this camera, it's going to send the signal to simultaneously fire the other R5 with the 200 to 800 millimeter lens. All right. Hope that uh, makes some sense. Yeah. No. Good. Yep. All right. I will go back to the screen share. Everything drivers here. Plus 75 
million Americans bracing for severe weather across <laughs> this hour. They said the leave. And we are the same state now mandating a twenty. All right. Could soon be making it Cool. So camera settings again. Manual exposure. Everything locked down. Spot meter off the sun. I even like a manual white balance. So I'm going to choose Kelvin or daylight, whatever you prefer. But lock it in because then you'll have less variation in your post production should you try to stack any of these images together for greater dynamic range. I use one shot. It may be different terminology for uh, Nikon and Sony, but what that means is the camera isn't constantly focusing. And it is kind of challenging to focus on the sun. There's no texture on it, like the moon. So you want to find the rim of the sun and focus on it. So watch the uh, little monitor here. Start. Yeah, a mutual friend in common. There we go. Oh, back. I like this person. Should be running. Yes. Okay. So this is a recording through my monitor. You'll see I'm going to go from evaluative metering to spot metering. So I'm metering right off the sun because there's so much darkness. Set my white balance. I like it a little bit warmer than daylight. To December 1987, and have been diagnosed with cancer. And then here we go. Try to focus. Right. And I'm just trying to line up the sun. That center circle you see is I'm using the Canon R3, and that is the spot meter indicator. And see the clouds moving across the sun? So just because there's clouds, don't give up, right? There was clouds on the day I was practicing. So I put the focusing acquisition on the edge of the sun where there's the most contrast between the sun disk rim. And now I'm going to one shot so it's not continuously focusing and we could focus in. Once we're focused in, I'm going to lock the focus to manual because the distance between my camera and the sun is not changing. I set my auto exposure bracket. Start from there. And if you have your cable release, you push and hold it. It's going to take all seven frames. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Instantaneously. So to rip right through those exposures. And then you can review the images, check your histogram. So here's the variation from 2017, seven exposure bracket. So you, you could see why I'm capping it at seven. If you go nine, 11, 13, you're really just getting darkness. And then when you're beyond seven, everything is so overexposed that it's a mush. So I didn't find value in trying to combine any more than seven images into one image for greater dynamic range. So that's something that all your cameras will do, the auto exposure bracketing. And there also is a feature to where it will stay on until it shuts off the bracketing, or it will shut off after each bracket sequence. So just note that so that when you're shooting and you get excited and you're in the moment that you may think it's bracketing and it's not. So that's why it's good to rehearse and practice ahead of time. Earbag, this was when I went in 17. So that was a 600 millimeter lens, 100 and 500, you know, two bodies. So we're all set to go. Extenders, okay, with the Google. Now, I thought this would be valuable. So the other day when I was practicing, I photographed the lens at the progression of all the focal lengths. So there's the size of the sun disk from 100 millimeters to 1200 millimeters. So again, we're not dealing with much detail. So if you have a 200 millimeter and you have to zoom in on the shot, do it. You know, you, you can blow it up. You can enhance it in Lightroom or Photoshop, or you could use Topaz to res the photo up. We're not dealing with a lot of texture and detail, so it will render out beautifully. Of course, it's always best to capture the image with the best focal length that you have at hand. But if you only have 100 millimeter, 200 millimeter, 300 millimeter, don't worry about it. It's all going to work out. So this is through the lens. I recorded my viewfinder. 
setting things up. Here we are, manual focus. This is the 600 millimeter with a 1.4 extender to give an effective focal length at 840 millimeters. So again, I run through the screen. I'm in manual. You can see when you look right at the center of the disc, it doesn't record any focus at all because there's zero contrast. The minute I get to the edge of the disc, then you saw it light up green, and that's because that's where the focus is and the contrast is, right? You can't focus on the center of the sun because there's zero detail, again, unlike the moon. And I'm in spot meter mode, so we are setting the exposure off of the sun. If you were in evaluative metering, it would account for all the darkness around the sun, and it might cause you to be more overexposed because the camera meter sees so much darkness. Okay. Now, here's the same view with the viewfinder with the 600 millimeter lens with a 2x extender effective focal length 1200 millimeters so the sun disc is much larger the schmutz you see on the surface there those are actually solar flares explosions that we're able to capture on the surface of, of the sun well, i've tracked that the year before and if you look at the surveys come on run through it who has on electric there we go it's moving so the more magnification, the easier it is to keep the sun within the center of your frame. But I keep confirming focus. Just for illustrative purposes. But once you're focused, it's not going to change. One shot, make sure it oh, locks it right in. And then it's to manual. And then I'll bracket my exposures from there. The exposure does change slightly with the more magnification because you're bringing more of the sun into the center of the frame versus if you're metering with the 200 millimeter lens, of course the camera meter is gonna see a lot more darkness. So that's why it's a good idea to practice your exposure before the day of the eclipse because the sun is the sun and the light will not change. So this is back to 2017. And that's what Rob and I woke up to at first light in the morning, right? So good thing we staked out. We were on the, the, the highest rock. It was kind of like our, our pride rock. No one else could come up there. So we didn't have to worry about anybody bumping our tripods. We were all good to go. The private sector, the world does. I have made no mistake about it. China is laughing. So here's your histogram. And this is at the darkest exposure. And here's why you want to underexpose so far. Those are the uh, prominence or solar flares during totality without the solar filter showing the uh, chromosphere and the red solar bursts. So your histogram is very far to the left, which it should be because there's a lot of darkness. Now, remember, the solar timer is so helpful because it'll prompt you to say, Hey, one minute to totality. Okay, remove solar filter. Where I made the mistake in 17 is I didn't take it off, so I missed the first diamond ring. Oh, and then here's the progression that you see throughout the bracket, right? The more you overexpose, the less red you see in those solar flares. And this is the total eclipse because now the moon is closer to the earth and totally eclipses or blocks out the light of the sun. And then this is the second diamond ring. So you get a diamond ring when it first happens, which I missed because I was too dark. And then you get the second diamond ring. And what's also nice about the solar eclipse timer is he's going to come on, the voice is going to come on and say, okay, 30 seconds or one minute to put on your solar filter. And it'll say, put on solar filter. So you don't harm your eyes and you don't harm the camera. So here's just the different variations in how I cycle through my AF methods. What they may be called on your camera brand is different, but I've programmed one button so that I could select and switch through single point spot AF, which is a precision, one point, an expanded surround, manual selection, and then auto selection AF. Now also keep in mind, there's no sun, I mean, there's no face on the sun. There is no animal to detect. So I told my camera, 
none. So it's not looking to detect something with the algorithm programmed into it. By telling none, it goes back to old school, just contrast and light to focus. And I found it locked on and acquired focus quicker because if you have any of the other detections active, it's going to be looking for those parameters first. Hope that makes sense. Cameras, lenses, you know, I, I'll have everything with me because you never know what the heck might happen. So I just overpack always because I never want to be there and say, I wish I would have, I wish I could have. And I'm just prepared. So bring what you're comfortable with. Be prepared. Bring a lawn chair, bring water, bring an umbrella for shade because you're going to be out there a couple hours. Be comfortable. This is just recapping my starting point and my settings again. You want the map so you can make sure you're in the path of totality. Get the solar eclipse timer. I find it invaluable. Glasses, a filter, nice long lens, good sturdy tripod. Figure out the base exposure or try these numbers. You know, again, I'm using a lower ISO because the R5, R3, their native ISO is 250, 200. That's the native ISO. So that means I'm going to get the cleanest image and the widest dynamic range. The closer you are to your camera's native ISO that it was designed for, the wider your dynamic range will be, meaning shadow highlight information that you could capture. So practice your focus, exposure, bracketing, taking the filter on, putting the filter on, taking the filter off, try and get it right in camera, and then bracket the exposures. And then if you do get that uh, solar timer, Rehearse with it. Run the rehearsal. It's really great. I'm still running through the rehearsal, and I hear a new tip each and every time. <laughs> so let's stop screen sharing, and we can open this up for some Q and A. Just a straightforward yeah. Any questions, thoughts, well, concerns, anything I can help you with? Were you, bra were you bracketing one or two steps? Bob? I was bracketing seven. Yeah, between each each uh, exposure, one stop difference or two stop difference? Yes, one stop difference. Okay. One stop. Two thirds of a stop or a third of a stop. Again, I too practiced little. too little. Yeah. Uh, more than one stop, then it's too dark on the dark end and too bright on the bright end. I just found one stop and seven to to work. If you if you practice on the sun, you'll see when you're beyond that, it gets really, really dark and really, really bright. And then again, when I even use them in combining them, it was too much. The combined image, the stacked image wasn't so well. So even oftentimes when I was combining for the wider dynamic range, I ended up only using four to five images because the bright was just too bright. You know, there's nothing there of the commercial traffic back to where it was before. The I would like to have a star tracker, you know, but again, I can't justify 600 bucks just for once every few years. And I don't do enough nighttime star photography to justify having a star tracker. I have an inexpensive one. It's about, I think it was about 250 bucks. And it was- Oh, really? Oh, all the yeah, ones called Move, now. Shoot, Move. Have, have been you know five six hundred maybe they up the prices yeah. on because it's last well year. no the, the really good ones are, are that expensive but this one I've, I've done some night photography and and it it stays pretty synced that's uh, all that matters the trick will be getting it lined to the north star during the day so i have an app to try to use that. oh sure <laughs> I, uh, um the other photographer ed wyland i know he's actually going to line it up at night uh, and then leave it you know, go from there and then just turn everything on when it's time. Yeah, there's a phone app that will help you. So I figure if it's close, sure. we're talking about the sun, we're not talking about stars in the Milky right. Way. Right. And it is. And then you could just eyeball it after if it's missing. Right. Eyes, if it's just a, a nudge. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. That's very helpful, Bob. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Have fun with it. You know, it really is. And don't forget to just enjoy it. Right. 
because I found it to be like what I would imagine Woodstock was like. It became this really cool hippie vibe. People were singing songs, having everybody was super friendly and helpful. And I, I just imagined that's what Woodstock was like. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be here in Rockford. It's supposed to be like 85 to 90 percent totality, which is fine. Oh, nice. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I think it's 60 percent. I'm going to try to come to Dallas or uh... yeah, let me know. I will. I will. I've been looking at plane tickets. That's the thing. I may try to look for cheaper plane tickets that are also in the totality range, but um, I don't know if the airlines... We'll, like, come you know, we'll pick you up. Don't worry about renting a car. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll message you. But yeah, I'm looking into it kind of now. So... Very cool. But yeah, and it's not too late to get stuff. Everybody's well-stocked on filters and glasses and so that that's really convenient. Very convenient. And enjoy it. Thanks for this, Bob. I appreciate Any, it. I, so before everybody cuts out, before I let you go, feedback. Is anything missing? Anything that could be different? Uh, I don't know enough about Eclipse, photographing the Eclipse, to, to think that you missed anything over on my side well do you feel uh, that it was enough information. information to empower you yeah, yeah yeah i got a lot of good information okay that's solar that's solar yep solar yeah, it's a practice and <laughs> five practice. minute shots the there's practice. a lot a lot to remember but i think you covered it cool well thank you guys hope you enjoy it have fun look forward share your photos later i'd love to see them absolutely have a good trip to texas yeah no thank you it'll be fun thank thanks, you man. Thanks, thanks everyone thank yeah. you thank you take care bye bye bye